And uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Ishai Kiel. Ishai uh, has a PhD uh, in uh, rabbinics and uh, Iranian studies uh, from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, nowadays, he, has, uh, he is a research associate, associate of our faculty of law at the Hebrew University. Uh, he was a lecturer at uh, Yale and a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, and his last book is about sexual sexuality in the uh, Babylonian culture. <coughs> Thank Firstly, I would like to thank the speakers for a fascinating and insightful talk. I had the opportunity to read several chapters of the speaker's forthcoming book, from which I have learned a great deal and for which I am immensely indebted. The first point... Ten seconds. The first point of my response concerns the compartmentalization of Maimonides Torah theory vis-a-vis -vis the various types included in this broad concept of, concept of Torahs, Nezikim or Nezakim. The speakers characterize Maimonides Torah theory as mixed and pluralistic, arguing that although the different objectives and rationales seem to operate in tandem and should not be viewed as mutually exclusive, Different objectives predominate in different types included in Maimonides' broad conception of torts. Along these lines, the speakers argue that, in the guide, Maimonides presents two meta-objectives in relation to pure torts, i.e. property damages and damages caused by a person, removal of the wrong, corrective justice, and prevention of future damages. With respect to bodily injuries, theft, robbery, and murder, which Maimonides also included in the Book of Torts, in his code and in his discussion of torts in the guide part 3 chapter 40 where he discusses pure torts Maimonides presented the criminal rationales of deterrence and desert whereas in the book of acquisition in which the laws of nuisance and the liability of guards are discussed Maimonides presented a rationale that contains elements of distributive justice the compartmentalization of the Maimonidean theory of torts vis-a-vis -vis the various types included in his discussion is related to the fact that Maimonides' conception of torts is much broader than what we typically include under this rubric in contemporary theories. The speakers astutely observe, and I quote, that the scope of tort law in Maimonides' theory is much wider than what is common in modern law, and it includes not only purely civil law from the field of the law of obligations, but also laws which have a significant connection to criminal law. According to Maimonides, tort law is an intermediate field between civil law and criminal law. The Book of Torts in the Code includes not only the classical laws of torts in the eyes of the modern jurist, such as the laws pertaining to damages that were caused by a person and by his property, but also areas which in modern law are included in the criminal law, such as the laws pertaining to murder, theft, and robbery, and in fact, the Book of Torts can be regarded as a civil criminal mix, end of quote. The question I would like to raise is whether, despite the diverging emphases placed by Maimonides on different objectives relating to different types of tort law, there is at the same time a common denominator that unifies the different legal types included in his discussion. I would like to posit that the scarlet thread that runs throughout the Book of Torts in the Code, although perhaps not in the equivalent discussion in the Guide, is the religious component in Maimonides' tort theory. The religious dimension roughly includes the notion of a prohibition against causing damage to another's property, body, or life, the obligation to preserve the property, body, and life of one's fellow humans, and the idea that any infringement and transgression of these obligations and prohibitions results in a state of religious sin that requires atonement, and in some cases also the procuring of forgiveness from the offended party. 
In this context, the notion of monetary payment functions not merely on the level of civil restitution, nor simply as a form of punitive payment in the more criminal-oriented context of physical injuries, theft, and robbery, but also, and no less importantly, as a form of religious atonement. While the speakers are aware of the importance of the religious component in Maimonides' tort theory, they argue that in the realm of property damage, and that of damage caused by a person, and I quote, the weight of this prohibitive moral element in Maimonides' tort theory should not be overstated. It is my contention that the religious component in Maimonides' tort theory, its prohibitive, obligatory, and penitential dimensions, constitute the scarlet thread uniting the various types subsumed by Maimonides under a broad and distinctive conception of tort law. At the beginning of the fifth chapter of the Laws of Property Damages in the Code, this is a passage we've seen, Maimonides asserts that it is forbidden for a person to cause damage, and then to pay for that damage, for the damage one caused. Even being a cause of damage is prohibited. The prohibitive dimension in Maimonides' tort theory is further emphasized with respect to a number of tortious acts for which it is taught that although one is not held liable according to human law, one is indeed held liable according to the laws of God. The prohibition against causing damage to another's property stands in direct correlation to the more obvious prohibitions pertaining to the criminally oriented acts of inflicting bodily injuries, theft, robbery, and murder, which are likewise included in the Book of Torts. Beyond the prohibition against causing damage to another's property, Maimonides stresses that there is also a positive obligation to save another's property from damage or loss, an obligation which is tantamount to the obligation to save the body and life of others. Thus, in the laws of robbery and lost property, 1120, Maimonides writes, if one sees water flooding and threatening to destroy another's building or field, one must place a barrier in the water's path and prevent it. For scripture says, and you shall do the same with anything else that your neighbor loses, including the loss of his land. Thus, both the prohibition against causing damage to another's property and the positive obligation to prevent the loss of another's property are situated in direct correlation to the criminal prohibitions against inflicting bodily injuries and manslaughter and the corresponding obligation to preserve the integrity of the human body and human life. Despite the difficulty involved in finding the biblical source for the prohibition against causing damage to another's property, and the fact that Maimonides waited, as it were, until the fifth chapter of the Laws of Property Damages to inform us that it is forbidden for a person to cause damage, I posit nonetheless that the ubiquity of the religious prohibitive dimension in the Book of Torts and the sense of equivalence that exists between the prohibitions and obligations pertaining to property damages, bodily injuries, and murder underscore the internal continuity between the various sections included in this book. Another religious element which links together the various components included in the Book of Torts is the role of monetary payments in both civil and criminal contexts in the overall religious process of penitence and particularly the need to procure atonement for one's sins, whether committed against God or one's fellow humans. While I agree with the speakers that the monetary payments due for property damages should not as a whole be regarded as, pu as punitive measure for, trans for transgressing the prohibition against causing damage to another's property, I must stress that the interpretation of these payments solely in terms of civil restitution, devoid of religious and theological significance, misses a major point in Maimonides' conception of tort law. Consider, for example, the Laws of Bodily Injuries 5.9. And I quote, a person who damages another's property is not like the one who physically injures another's body. For when a person who damages another's property pays the damages he owes, his sin is atoned, or is atoned for, nit capello. But when a person physically injures another's body, even if he paid the five payments, his sin is not atoned for. And even if he were to sacrifice all the rams of Nevayot, Elei Nevayot Shavala, his sin is not atoned for, nor his transgression forgiven, until he asks the injured party for forgiveness, and the injured party forgives him. On the overt level, Maimonides seems to stress here the difference between the laws of property damages and those of bodily injuries, insofar as the former requires only monetary compensation, 
while the latter requires both monetary payment, be it punitive or compensatory, and the procuring of the injured party's forgiveness. That said, Maimonides invokes the term atonement, kapara, for both property damages and bodily injuries, rather than the civil notions of compensation or restitution, thus triggering the theological arena of penitence. Unlike physical injuries, which necessitate the procuring of verbal forgiveness from the offended party, alongside monetary payments in order to meet the religious requirement of atonement, the payments due for property damages are sufficient for meeting this end. Since both physical injury and property damages constitute the transgression of a religious prohibition, both require atonement. The difference is merely in the fact that unlike bodily injuries, property damages do not offend another's person and therefore do not require verbal forgiveness beyond monetary restitution. This passage should be read, read intertextually in the light of Maimonides' assertion in the Laws of Repentance 2.9, in which he discusses the relationship between religious atonement, monetary compensation, and procuring verbal forgiveness from the offended party. And I quote, Repentance and the Day of Atonement atone only for the sins pertaining to the relations between a person and God. For example, a person who ate forbidden foods or engaged in forbidden sexual relations, or the like. However, sins pertaining to the relations between a person and his fellow humans, for example, someone who injured another, curses another, robs him, or the like, such a sinner will never be forgiven until he pays the offended party what he owes and appeases this person. Even if he paid the money he owes, he must appease his fellow human and ask for forgiveness. Once again, the reason property damages do not require appeasing and procuring verbal forgiveness from the offended party beyond monetary compensation is because they, because they do not entail injury to another's person. This difference, however, hardly excludes tortious acts in the narrow sense from the overarching religious paradigm of sin and atonement that governs Maimonides' coach. It is tempting to read Maimonides' claims about the need to appease the offended party and procure forgiveness in cases of bodily injuries in the light of contemporary attempts to introduce apology laws into the tort system. It must be stressed, however, that for Maimonides, both the monetary payment and the psychological emotional dimension of forgiveness are intended not merely to restore the offended party to his or her prior state, but also, and perhaps more importantly, to atone for one's sins. Since monetary payments due for tortious acts are intended to achieve not only civil restitution, but also religious atonement, it should come as no surprise that Maimonides took great pains to determine whether one can procure atonement even when, for some reason, monetary restitution cannot be made in full, as in the case of a stolen object that can no longer be returned. The question, to be sure, is essential and pertains not only to the criminal act of theft, but also to property damages. Elsewhere, I have argued that Maimonides' classification of compensatory and punitive monetary payments as components in the broader religious system, concerned with sin and atonement, echoes contemporaneous taxonomies, voiced by Jewish, Islamic, and Zoroastrian jurists. To mention but one example, Maimonides' assertion in the Laws of Repentance 2.9 closely resembles a statement found in the Shaist Nishaist, literally, that which is permissible and that which is not permissible, a 10th century Zoroastrian legal work in Middle Persian, according to which in order to atone for sins pertaining to one's fellow humans, we na i hamem Allah, in contrast to the sins pertaining to one's soul, we na i duani, one must resolve his sin, both monetarily and psychologically, in the presence of the offended party. Similarly, Maimonides' discussion of whether one can procure atonement even when monetary compensation cannot be made in full echoes the discussions of Shmuel ben Chofni and Abid al-Jabbar ibn Ahmed, a Mu'tazilite theologian and follower of the Shafi'i school of law, both of whom use the very same example of a stolen object. The idea that compensatory payments do for tortious acts, not unlike punitive payments do for bodily injuries, function in the religious sphere, not in terms of a criminal sanction, so much as in terms of a means for procuring atonement, forgiveness, and religious rectification, highlights the overlapping roles of Maimonides 
as theologian and jurist. The speaker's attempt to isolate and abstract the civil and criminal rationales reflected in Maimonides' tort theory is important mainly insofar as the discussion in the guide is concerned, but is perhaps somewhat problematic when applied to the code. In the context of the latter, the religious dimension not only surfaces at various junctures, but also seems to unify and connect the seemingly unrelated types comprising the Book of Torahs. It is the overarching theology of sin and atonement that ultimately links the different sections of the Book of Torahs and creates a conceptual continuum between the laws of property damage, the laws of theft and robbery, the laws of bodily injuries, and the laws of murder and the preservation of life. This is not to say that there are no significant differences between the various civil and criminal rationales operating in each section. And the speakers have done an exemplary job in demonstrating these diverging emphases. However, it would seem that the structure of the Book of Torahs as a whole and the inherent interconnectedness of its various sections is underwritten by a common adherence to a theological paradigm governed by the system of sin and atonement. Another example of theological and religious continuity between the sections of the Book of Torts, without denying, of course, the existence of diverging rationales that operate in particular sections, is the idea of the indispensability of human life. At first glance, it might seem that this concept pertains only to the final section of the book, i.e. the laws of murder, the murderer and the preservation of life. However, a closer look reveals that even the disregard of another's property is in some respect tantamount to taking a life. <coughs> Consider, for example, the laws of robbery and lost property 113. If one robs another of property worth a single puta, it is regarded as if he took his, li his living soul. <laughs> for scripture says, such is the end of all who are greedy for gain, it takes away the life of its possessors. Proverbs 119. The idea that there is an essential continuum between disregard of another's property and taking his or her life brings the laws pertaining to the loss of property, whether criminal or civil in nature, much closer to those pertaining to bodily injuries and manslaughter. It is as if Maimonides is saying, beware of transgressing even the least of prohibitions against harming or causing damage to another's property, for you are one step away from, the, from disregarding the disregard of human life. To the extent that the indispensability of human life can shed light not only on the laws of manslaughter but also on the laws of bodily injuries and property damages, perhaps we might consider the facilitation of this idea as a distinctive theological, philosophical rationale <coughs> governing Maimonides' tort theory, in addition to the other rationales. Maimonides famously classified in the guide for <coughs> chapter 27 the general rationales for God's precepts according to a tripartite taxonomy. One, the perfection of the soul, that is, the human <clears throat> intellect, which is regarded as the greatest and most noble end of the mitzvot. Two, the perfection of the human psyche and inner traits. And three, the perfection of the physical existence, which is only conceivable as part of a political association, as argued by Aristotle. For an individual can only attain all this through a political association, it being already known that man is political by nature. In terms of tort theory, the speakers have emphasized the existence of several competing rationales in the guide and in the code, all of which fall within the limits of Maimonides' notion of the perfection of the body, that is, rationales two and three. The perfection of the physical existence and human society on the one hand, and the perfection of the human psyche on the other hand. The deontological consideration pertaining to removal of the wrong and corrective justice, and the consequentialist consideration regarding the prevention of future damages clearly fall under the first rubric of the perfection of the, of the, of the uh, physical existence in human society. The psychological considerations function in two complementary manners. On the one hand, they affect a change in the individual, regardless of the benefit to the broader society. But on the other hand, they also contribute to the perfection of human society, in the sense that the transformative effect on the human psyche is conducive to a more perfect society. What seems, however, to be missing from this taxonomy is the first, and according to Maimonides, the most important and noble rationale for the Torah's precepts, namely the perfection of the soul and the human intellect. While it is possible that Maimonides did not consider such an end in the context of his Torah theory, 
I posit that the, that the distilling and indoctrination of the idea of the indispensability and integrity of human life is one such objective. Consider, for example, the following assertion in the laws of the murderer and the preservation of life. 1-4. The court is enjoined not to accept ransom from the murderer to save him from execution, even if he gave all the money in the world and even if the blood redeemer was willing to forgive him. He should be executed nonetheless. The rationale is that the soul of the victim is not the property of the blood redeemer, but the property of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> and he commanded, do not accept ransom for the soul of the murderer. There is nothing that the Torah warns so strongly against as murder. As it says, do not pollute the land in which you live, for the blood will pollute the land. In the same chapter, Halakha 16, with regard to the saving of human life, Maimonides asserts, for if one destroys the life of a single Israelite, quoting the Mishnah, or the one version of the Mishnah, it is regarded as though he destroyed the entire world. And if one preserves the life of a single Israelite, it is regarded as though he preserved the, the entire world. The idea of the indispensability of human life is rooted in Maimonides' biblical and Talmudic heritage. Scholars have long noted the distinctiveness of the Bible's disposition towards human life when compared against other ancient Near Eastern cultures, as reflected, for example, in the biblical distinction between the shedding of innocent blood and crimes against property, a distinction echoed by Maimonides. Unlike Cuneiform law, the Bible generally maintains that humanity was made in God's image, and therefore human life is unquantifiable, and the shedding of innocent blood cannot be rectified through monetary compensation. These dimensions of biblical ideology, particularly the emphasis placed on the indispensability of human life, were carried on into the Talmudic discussions. But Maimonides did not simply rehearse these ideas, entrenched in the biblical and rabbinic heritage. He made them into the cornerstone of his book of Torts. Beyond scattered references comparing the loss of another's property to the taking of human life and the like, the very structure of the book of torts as a whole, beginning with property damages, moving on to theft and robbery, then to bodily injuries, and culminating in the laws of the murder and the preservation of life, tells us something about the telos of the book and the purpose of the Torah's precepts pertaining to tort law. It is in this context that the philosophical theological rationale concerning the indispensability of human life illuminates Maimonides' overall system of tort theory, in the sense that all the laws contained in the book of torts are intended to facilitate knowledge of and respect for the <coughs> indispensability and integrity of human life created in God's image. In light of Maimonides' acute awareness of the importance of the idolatrous backdrop of the Torah's precepts, it is conceivable to imagine that he viewed the idea of the indispensability of human life in direct contrast to the surrounding ancient Near Eastern cultures for which human life was dispensable and quantifiable. Whether or not Maimonides could have possibly made such a claim with regard to the ancient Near Eastern cultures of the biblical time, as he had done with regard to the Torah's ritual and sacrificial laws, he definitely knew the practice of blood money that permeated Islamic law, and thus may have viewed the indispensability and unquantifiability of human life as a philosophical, theological truth that requires indoctrination via an elaborate tort system. Thank you. <laughs>